Okay, welcome everybody as you're joining. Um, we still have people that are joining, and so we're going to give them a, another minute or so to get on, and then we'll get started. But in the meantime, I'm Debbie Silverstein. I'm the State Director for Single Payer Action Network of Ohio. And this is a continuation of our um, state conference that we would have held in April down in Columbus if it hadn't been for the virus um, and stuff. So we've been doing it month by month. And it's actually working out quite well. So um, we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Um, we're very happy that uh, we're going to have Mike Skindle, the sponsor of our bill in the Ohio House with us. And he is going to tell us um, the particulars of the bill and what we can do to help move the bill forward and what some of the benefits hopefully might have been during um, this pandemic you know, um, if we had had this bill in place, if it had been enacted and we had this system in place. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing tonight is that we're going to be making uh, our Smitty Award uh, presentation and we do that every year. That's a, um, it's the one award that we give each year to an individual or a group that has exhibited um, exemplary um, advocacy for healthcare justice. And so we're really excited about um, being able to do that tonight. And then next month, and I want, to, I want to invite you to join us again next month when we will be having Ivanka Hall, the Executive Director of the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition to be discussing racism in healthcare and stuff. So right now I'm going to introduce Representative Mike Skindle and um, he's going to take the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Deb, and uh, thank you, uh, everybody who has joined uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, let me just introduce myself uh, for a, a moment. Uh, uh, I, as Deb said, I am uh, State Representative Mike Skindle. I am actually in my 18th year in the Ohio General Assembly. Prior to going to uh, the legislature, I was on Lakewood City Council in the Cleveland uh, area uh, for five years. Um, and let me just, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background of why I kind of got involved in uh, this healthcare issue. Uh, what I have been doing over the 18 years uh, in the legislature on this, uh, Bernie Sanders has been fighting for this for a long time also. So, uh, but, uh, uh, and then uh, kind of, we'll talk about the bill and also what would um, a single payer or a Medicare for all look like in a pandemic uh, time frame. Uh, so uh, with regard to myself, so I represent uh, the 13th House District. Um, I, I am actually in my 10th year, uh, let me get that right. Uh, 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 yeah, my 10th my year of service in the House, and then I had eight years in the Ohio Senate. I was elected back in um, uh, 2002 uh, after having served on Lakewood City Council. Um, I have a real unique interest in uh, universal health care, single payer, that has existed a, a good portion of my life. My grandfather introduced it to me when I was a child. He was a UAW union steward uh, who had served under Walter Ruther. Uh, and those who know the UAW and Walter Ruther in the 1950s, uh, the 40s and 50s, uh, Walter Ruther really fought hard uh, as head of the, the uh, national UAW to try to uh, get a, a single payer, a publicly financed universal health care system uh, in this nation. Uh, and he, it didn't start with him, though, because FDR actually uh, attempted to push it. And, and there were efforts to push universal health care uh, back uh, as far back as the late 1800s, uh, the 1880s, uh, in fact. So uh, this effort has been out there for some time. Uh, my, I, I grew up in a steel working family. My grandfather was the, the auto worker. I, I would always say actually, uh, my, my Skindo grandfather uh, uh, mined the coal that uh, 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 fueled the steel factories that my father worked in to help make the automobiles that my grandfather worked in. Uh, so, but my father was a steel worker. Um, so we, for the most part, had, had decent health care um, uh, through uh, uh, 
the United Steelworkers uh, for many years. Now, uh, as you know, my, my father worked out of uh, the Cleveland area for Republic Steel, which then uh, was taken over by LTV Steel, which then ended up going into bankruptcy. And when LTV went into bankruptcy, um, some 72,000 uh, workers and retirees lost their health care. Uh, and that bankruptcy ruling came uh, around uh, February of 2002. Interesting, it was the year that I had been running uh, for the legislature uh, and the year that I won the legislature. Um, and so my, my dad had uh, dis been deceased since uh, 1992, but my, my mother would have been the beneficiary of that health care and she lost lost it. And now with my mom on, on Medicare alone, um, she has, uh, she pays a significant amount of money, uh, primarily for medications. Uh, and it would just be uh, amazing what we could be doing in this country uh, with regard to health care if we had a, a universal and, and, and basically a, a sound, broad uh, coverage uh, in that. Now, um, when I was on Lakewood City Council, SPAN, uh, the Single Payer Action Network, had actually already formed. It was in, it was in, an, in its infancy. Uh, and there was a group of uh, Lakewood residents who were advocating for health care that actually came to several of us on Lakewood City Council to see if we could pass a resolution in support of the state adopting a single payer universal health care system at the state level. And I, um, uh, was successful in, in getting that through uh, uh, Lakewood City Council and working with that group from SPAN. I then entered the legislature uh, and uh, during that course of the election in 2002, I worked uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Ross and, and many others and um, SPAN worked hard to develop language uh, for the, uh, the legislation that we would introduce uh, in 2003. And uh, when I was uh, entering the legislature, I approached uh, then Senator Bob Hagan out of the Youngstown area. And of those who know Bob Hagan, Bob had been pursuing a type of universal health care for some 20 years prior to that. Uh, it, he had failed to uh, introduce it for a couple of years. So when I came forward with SPAN, and SPAN was working on Bob anyways in the Youngstown area, um, uh, Bob and I joined with SPAN. We drafted the legislation, and we have been introducing that legislation for the most part in the Ohio House and the, the Senate every year. So, so we introduced in 2003, 2005, 2007, 2009, 2011, uh, 13, 15, 17, uh, 19, and, um, uh, uh, and, and now that's where we are. Uh, and we, we keep on advocating this. At, at a period of time, we actually had a, a measure to try to go on the ballot and uh, span and some uh, particularly UAW union workers uh, and UAW put some money behind it, collected over 100,000 signatures uh, to try to get on the ballot. Unfortunately, it fell short of about uh, from uh, the 400,000 signatures or so that were was needed to actually get on the ballot. But that was a significant effort uh, to do that. Um, what we see in the, the initiative, the, the ballot issue is uh, particularly um, I think although generally labor and some business support this, uh, they have not been willing to invest the money because they know it's probably gonna be a $10 million investment plus uh, a minimum of 10 million to get it on the ballot and try to get the money to do the advertising uh, to try to get it passed in the state of Ohio as, as a ballot issue, uh, whether uh, to our statutes or to the constitution. Um, so we keep on advocating within the General Assembly. And one thing I don't want to do in the, in the folks of SPAN is to, to not bring this forward. It, it's so essential. We need to keep on hammering every single year. There's been some times we, we've been very successful um, in getting some hearings, uh, particularly uh, the last session. 
uh, and other times we haven't. It depends upon the committee chairs uh, and, and uh, generally uh, uh, the feeling down there. Uh, my, my belief is we just, as a nation, need to continue this advocacy. Um, uh, it is more likely that the national government would move on a, a, a broader Medicare for all if states start uh, adopting their own version. Um, so under the state legislation, which has uh, existed for the most part in, uh, 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 since uh, 2002, 2003, when we put the legislation together, uh, you know, we create a health care board uh, that uh, basically sets up the agency that, that runs uh, uh, the single payer system in the state of Ohio. We would seek federal waivers from Medicare and Medicaid uh, uh, to, to bring in the, the Medi Medicaid recipients and, and uh, the Medicare folks uh, into that system. Uh, uh, we did have at one point from the Legislative Service Commission a fiscal analysis, and um, I, I believe that fiscal analysis said that the program would cost about $70 billion, but what is already put into the system in Medicaid and Medicare, uh, we already have about $35 billion of that uh, put forward. Uh, and uh, the, the remaining amount would become would come through a progressive uh, taxation. Uh, taxation, uh, again, that, that falls on those that are, are more able to pay uh, for, for health care. Now, uh, and there's been discussion, uh, should we modify that? We have not modified that in the legislation. My, my belief is uh, if we get hearing, if we get really serious in the legislature, uh, there's going to be a lot of amendments. Uh, my belief is right now the bill that we have is a bill that has been supported by over 100,000 people that have signed a petition. And I, I think we need to stick with that until we really get into the legislative process and they, they want to start taking amendments in consideration of passage. Uh, and I think uh, there's work that needs to be done uh, within the language in, in several areas because there's, uh, we have learned so much more uh, the tax structures in the countries have changed, uh, and um, uh, uh, I think we can all bring that to the table. And, and if we, we, we get serious in the General Assembly to pass this, uh, we can sit down with all the advocates, all the interested parties to, to try to get something uh, very strong uh, in this. Um, so under the Ohio single payer health care system, um, any resident in the state of Ohio would be eligible uh, 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 to have that health care. Uh, what I am amazed is uh, my mother's family, uh, many of them live in Germany, and I have visited them, my mom's cousins uh, in Germany, and my mom's one cousin, um, was. I was asking her when I was visiting one time in Germany, uh, because we actually had to take my mom to uh, a, a pharmacy there because she got... Uh, uh, a little bit of, of a stomach uh, flu. Uh, by the way, my mom went there and cost her nothing to get the medication. Uh, and she didn't even have to submit her insurance to get the medication to get rid of that stomach flu. Uh, but I asked my cousin, I said, do you feel that your taxes are overwhelming uh, to support the medic, uh, the, the, the healthcare system that you have in Germany, the, the near universal healthcare system that they have in Germany? Uh, and she said, no. She said, look, um, uh, if I get ill, go to the hospital, I go to the hospital, I don't get a bill. I never see a bill. Uh, I don't have to pay anything. It's all uh, paid for. And it's worth it. I don't think my tax is too, too high. In addition, in Germany, uh, in talking about this taxation with my cousin, her daughter, she mentioned about her daughter. Her daughter goes to the university, had gone to the University of Tübingen uh, out, uh, near Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, she was in a six-year law program, and she was just paying $100 a year for that uh, uh, um, higher level um, um, uh, uh, college education, uh, $100 a year. That's all it cost her. Uh, and so when my cousin was responding to the taxes, she was also responding, the health care doesn't place a burden on us, the, 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 uh, the higher education, the free higher education doesn't place a burden. And my cousin 
Uh, her husband passed away uh, very suddenly, and my cousin ended up having a, a nervous breakdown for that. And because of the healthcare system, if you know Germany, they have these spas, uh, and they're somewhat of like a mental health uh, facility, uh, but really nice, uh, real nice spas. She went there for two months. Uh, she got um, her wages paid, and everything was covered by the healthcare system for her stay at the spa. And she came out, and let me tell you, she's extremely healthy uh, mentally and, and physically, and uh, it, 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 uh, the, the healthcare system benefits that. It also, her mother is in uh, a nursing facility and the, the system actually covers um, uh, her mother's care. And uh, they, uh, she's very pleased on, on the delivery of care for her mother uh, who's in a long-term care facility in Germany. So, you know, that, that's an example and that, you know, that's why I, I keep on pushing it. Now, as we, we turn into the pandemic here, uh, just imagine, um, so, uh, we, you know, we, when the passage of Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act occurred, we covered a lot more people. Uh, it still cost a lot for a lot of people. Um, that cost would not be there uh, to that level. Uh, the cost on the employers would not be there to that level. Uh, and uh, um, the, the problem is with the affordable health care, there still was a significant number of uninsured uh, Americans uh, in this country and uninsured children and uninsured uh, um, and veterans who, who were not getting um, uh, the care, uh, some care that they, they were hoping for. Um, and um, um, uh, so when the pandemic hit and the, the shutdown occurred, uh, several things happened. Large groups of people were laid off. Uh, and then also a significant number of people were furloughed. And there's a difference on how that plays out with healthcare. When you're furloughed, it's expected that you're off for a period of time, but you're going to be returning to work. Uh, and usually the employer, they don't have to, but the employer will keep the benefits uh, from life insurance to healthcare in place for furloughed employees. But when you're laid off, and that's where the vast majority of people found themselves, um, many employers do not keep uh, the benefits in place, uh, and people are responsible uh, to, to find their own health care. Some of that can be extended through COBRA, but those COBRA payments, as we all know, can become very expensive. Uh, so uh, when the economic shutdown occurred, a lot of people lost their jobs. Those that could not afford to uh, lose their health care because maybe they had uh, a, a, a sick uh, dependent, uh, a dependent who really need that health care coverage, maybe, maybe their spouse was treating with cancer or something like that. They did everything they could to stay at work um, um, this, and put themselves at risk, at harm's way, uh, with this virus, and that's continuing to occur. So if we did have uh, a, a universal uh, publicly funded healthcare system in this country, what we could do is it would help out economically uh, people uh, when, when there are these shuts down, these closures, uh, that people would stay home and uh, self-isolate at home uh, to stop the spread of such a, a, a deadly virus. Uh, so that would be uh, 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 very important. It, um, it, uh, the universal health care in a, in a virus situation, if you lost your job through a layoff or, or just uh, outright closure, so many places, retail establishments have closed uh, permanently, uh, you would continue that health care. We know right now that um, uh, the president, um, uh, and the Republicans have filed a, uh, a brief in the uh, United States Supreme Court asking for um, uh, the United States Supreme Court to throw out the Affordable Health Care Act. What did that Affordable Health Care Act do? That Affordable Health Care Act kept uh, people on their parents' insurance 
into their uh, mid-20s while they were going to school. The Affordable Health Care Act uh, made sure that um, if you had a pre-existing condition, um, you would not lose insurance coverage uh, should you have temporarily lost your job and lost insurance coverage and then uh, later on uh, picked up your insurance. Because if you have a pre-existing insurance, as we know prior to the Affordable Health Care Act, insurance just would not insure you or the cost of that uh, would be out of reach for, for many uh, Americans. Uh, so uh, a, a universal, publicly funded, um, uh, universal health care system uh, would uh, um, resolve all, many of those issues. Uh, in addition, we could use that to control cost, uh, particularly uh, within the pharmaceutical realm, which is one of the cost, most costly areas of health care. We can also use that universal health care system to control cost with regard to duplicate uh, uh, duplication of services uh, in a service area. We used to have, Dr. Ross knows this, we used to have what's called a certificate of need program for hospitals, uh, which uh, um, um, uh, the hospital industry was able to get rid of uh, back uh, in uh, the early 2000s, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, totally. So they, uh, you know, every hospital can have that MRI, every hospital can have that uh, open heart surgery. Every hospital can can do the the most uh, um, uh, um, uh, profitable uh, procedure out there, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it it drives up uh, healthcare costs. So a, a publicly funded universal healthcare system can actually really start going after that. Now, one of the biggest arguments against it is take a look at Medicare or Medicaid. And under those systems, uh, the reimbursements are such that um, um, uh, doctors don't want to um, uh, see Medicare or Medicaid patients uh, because they are not getting reimbursed enough. Uh, you know, that that is troubling. Canada experiences that so much, but we need to make sure uh, we as a country has a commitment one, to make sure that uh, the delivery of a service, an office visit, is all reasonable. And, and we can put in mechanisms to make sure of that. And we can put in mechanisms to make sure that um, it's just not a political decision about, well, wh whether we're going to put enough money in uh, to pay doctors into the system. Uh, it should be uh, uh, worked into the systems. And those are, those, those are the types of things uh, that seriously we do need to address uh, to make sure that um, uh, you know our medical professionals are reasonably reimbursed for that. Uh, one of the final things I, I kind of want to take up before we we take questions is that uh, uh, the single payer healthcare system that we proposed in Ohio, the Medicare for all, is not socialism uh, of healthcare as you see in. Um, uh, for example, in uh, England. In England, uh, the doctors and everything, the delivery of the healthcare system is totally owned and controlled by the government uh, as well as the payment. Here in these systems that we talk about Medicare or we're talking about the single payer uh, system, a uh, publicly financed universal healthcare system, we're talking about uh, doctors working uh, in their own practices, um, uh, hospitals running as hospitals, not owned by the government, it's not employed by the government, uh, but they're getting paid by the government. So we're just talking about a, a, a payment system uh, in the single payer or the, uh, the Medicare system. And, uh, you know, and, and if they say, well, um, uh, you know, this is kind of unique, it's not unique. Uh, we have it in, in Medicare, we have it in the veteran system. Um, uh, uh, this health care, and uh, the problem is we just need to improve upon it, expand it um, to make sure it covers every American, uh, make sure that um, the, all the services and, and the um, 
uh, pharmaceuticals are, are covered by the system. And we also need to address that, that uh, looming issue of long-term care. I, I will say that in the single payer system that we introduced, we wanted to bring in uh, the long-term care. We did not for many reasons, but that's something that should be really discussed. I, I strongly support uh, that uh, you know, uh, the long-term care system should be covered on this. Uh, but we need to make sure it's it's good quality long-term care as well as good quality long uh, health care across the board. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Debbie and and others, I I don't know if any, uh, uh, Dr. Ross or any of the others have any other comments, but uh, I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Mike. Before we go to questions, we're going to do our um, the presentation of the the Bob Smitty Healthcare Justice Award. And the Bob Smitty Healthcare Justice Award is usually awarded to a person that exemplifies the spirit that Bob Smitty had in his quest for healthcare justice. And it was a story that Dave Pavlik told me years and years ago that um, when SPAN was first getting started and they first thought that they might want to do um, a ballot initiative, you know, Smitty brought it up uh, to Jerry Gordon. And Jerry said, well, I don't know, Smitty. He says, you know, we've got to get, you know, so many signatures in 44 of the 88 counties. And, you know, and, you know, I, I, he says, there's only two of us. How are we going to do that? And, and Smitty says, but Jerry, there's no time limit. We can do it. You know, and so that is the spirit that, that we're looking for among healthcare justice warriors and that. And this year we are very excited to be able to award this to somebody who has been a staunch ally of SPAN Ohio since the very, very beginnings of SPAN, who was there at the forefront and who has put forth effort to try and get this passed on a, a yearly, a daily basis, who's not afraid to speak up publicly for it and, um, and, and even take a little bit of heat from colleagues and that type of thing. And so this year, we are pleased to award this to Michael J. Skindle. Oh, wow. That's a real surprise. Thank you. That, oh, look at that. So, and I will bring this to you, the actual thing, I will bring it to you next week. Oh, uh, how wonderful. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you, both uh, um, uh, Smitty and Gordon were just... Uh, just incredible people, and uh, this is this is a real honor and surprise. So, uh, thank you so much. I'm real honored. Well, you're you're we're we're honored to be able to work with you on this, and to you know continue to work with you on this as the years go by, and that, and we hope that the it's not too many more years before um, we will get this job done. So we want to really put the push on and stuff. While we're um, thinking about it, can you quickly go over? What do we need to do with the legislators in order to get them to move this bill? Well, so for example, uh, there's, we're in an election year right now. Uh, usually I would say we're, um, we're in a pandemic election year. Uh, in the non-pandemic election year, I would, uh, as many of you know, I would say your local legislators, make sure you, you call your candidates, call them up, Try to get a cup of coffee with them someplace or beer, if that's the case, uh, and talk to them about the issue. Many of the candidates and a number of the legislators, not all, and, and uh, Deb and others know that not all are willing to meet, but uh, a number of them will. And a lot of them don't know about the issue, uh, particularly candidates. So there's a slew of new people running for office in the legislature right now. Uh, since you, it's tough to have that cup of coffee, you might be able to do it with some social distancing. Try to see if you can get a, a telephone meeting with them uh, and, and talk to them about the issue on the telephone. Uh, 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 those, those legislators that are running throughout the state of Ohio, both, it, it is really important to hit both Democrats and Republicans. This is a, a health care and, uh, and making sure we have a, a health care system where People can be part of it through a single payer, uh, publicly financed uh, healthcare system um, is a uh, nonpartisan issue. It, it goes across party lines. Everybody uh, at one time or another will be uh, need medical care. Uh, so this, this is an important thing. And uh, you know, um, you need to educate both Democrats and Republicans about this bill, uh, that it will be brought forward. Uh, if I am there, 
it will be brought forward uh, in the next session. Uh, and we have, uh, we already, we do have some great legislators around the state uh, who are, are part of this. Uh, and we just gotta, we gotta keep it uh, in the Senate and in the House both and, and keep it on the forefront and then um, try to work on getting those committee hearings. But meet and talk to your legislators, send them emails, the candidates, uh, send them emails and try to get a telephone conference with them. If you can, try to meet them for a cup of coffee and keep your social distancing and wear your mask. Good, thank you. Dr. NJ and Dr. Ross will be monitoring the hands that are being raised. So right now, let's go to the chat and start with the and first And they might be able to help uh, with questions. <laughs> yeah. The um, first question in the chat was, um, does House Bill 292 actually fund universal health care, or is it just enabling legislation to make it possible? Uh, it actually uh, provides the mechanisms to fund. So, and it tells uh, where the taxes would be placed. Um, uh, actually, it, it's enabling legislation and uh, guiding it how it should be funded. Uh, there, there is still some uh, uh, appropriation uh, language that would have to be put in place to make sure it was, it was properly funded. Uh, but uh, the legislation actually lays out uh, how the taxes uh, uh, to fund it um, uh, should be dealt with. Okay. Um, do we have any hands up? Not so far. Okay. Then, um, Bill, why don't you go to the next question? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mary Huck asks, how many children lost health care along with their laid off parents due to the pandemic? So uh, I was reading some statistics on this that uh, 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 literally uh, 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 several tens of thousands of uh, children uh, lost health care. Uh, now we did uh, uh, a number of years ago, uh, Ohio actually was pretty good in establishing uh, the, uh, the Ohio uh, state health uh, insurance program that helps uh, uh, cover uh, uh, some high-risk children and things like that, and it covers something like 210,000 children in the state. Uh, but um, uh, a lot of families uh, lost health care coverage uh, because of the pandemic and, and the layoffs and um, that uh, the layoffs and the lost jobs that have occurred. Any hands up? Yeah, Bob Crason has his hand up. I'll, I think I can unmute him. Yes, Mike, thanks again for all you've done over the uh, years. Hey, Bob. Uh, introducing this bill and pr pushing it through. Um, I wonder if there has been any change in discussion among legislators since the onset of COVID and their realization that uh, joining uh, health care along with employment is a very bad idea. And we finally see the folly of that with all the uh, layoffs and people losing their health care. Uh, have you noticed any shift in the legislature? So let me say that I, I saw a greater shift in the legislature back in 2006, 2017, and 2018 uh, after Bernie Sanders and, and others really raised it to the top of the uh, national agenda. Uh, the unfortunate part is uh, in this year's uh, election, uh, it was, the topic was again being raised. Uh, uh, it, however, it seemed uh, pr uh, by the Democrats, it seemed, however, that the Democrats, you know, so Bernie Sanders and some others were strongly supportive of the uh, Medicare for all uh, system, but then you had other Democrats uh, attacking that and kind of pushing it down, and, and people ended up being confused. Um, and when you get that, they, they hesitate and they back off. And so what I've seen this year, uh, last year and this year, is people backing off more. Uh, now with the pandemic, there has been some general talk uh, on the progressive side of, of, of uh, the healthcare issue again, but the, the, the folks that are in the middle, the folks that are on the right, um, they're, they're not uh, 
embracing the concept. And uh, part of it is, uh, again, the, the education uh, and uh, when, when, the, when the systems are being attacked, really having the capability uh, to respond to them uh, and get the message out. But when you have people on MSNBC, for example, attacking uh, Medicare for all uh, and, and having the same message over and over and over, which is supposed to be a liberal forum, um, it, it, uh, it doesn't help things out. Um, Bill, do you, um, you want to go to the chat and read the next question? Uh, yeah, I might have gotten this out of order, but uh, Michael Kent was asking uh, if, if it's appropriate, what are the lessons from Vermont and what will we do to succeed where they failed? Oh, you know, uh, Ted Seuss was on uh, the line. Uh, I did a, uh, one of these uh, a little while ago and Ted talked about, I think it was Ted that talked about Vermont a little bit more. Um, Deb or uh, Dr. Roth, were you able to pick up that uh, that question, that response about Vermont? Yeah, um, it's complicated. Is the simple, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the it was a very complicated political situation. Uh, they brought up one of the world's experts in national health insurance systems, John Shaw, who's a, a health economist. He helped Taiwan form their single payer system, had him go through all the pluses and minuses with the legislature. And they actually uh, foundered on the funding. And there are two big issues around the funding. One was, what do we do about all the border states? Because Vermont's a small state, a lot of people cross the borders into New York, over into New Hampshire, south into Massachusetts for work. And that was a, a, a situation that they weren't really sure how to cope with it. And if they tried to cover uh, those out of area uh, employees that were coming into Vermont and then the ones who were working outside of Vermont, it, it made it a very complex uh, financial uh, calculation. The second thing that happened, because there was, of course, tremendous um, health system resistance to, uh, to reform, uh, the election uh, was actually closer for Sh uh, Shumlin than anyone thought it was going to be. And it was so close because there was a third party can uh, or a third candidate in that race. It got thrown into the House of Representatives. And from what I understand from insiders in Vermont, it may be that Shumlin had to make a promise uh, that he would drop uh, health care for all. Uh, and, and a single payer in Vermont in exchange for getting a couple of votes that he needed to continue being governor. So it was a very complicated political set of circumstances. Now, th those things still exist. I mean, we still have issues about what to do about border crossing. Uh, we, we have a big border with Michigan, a big border with Indiana, a big border with Kentucky, a big border with West Virginia, and even a little border with Pennsylvania. Um, uh, although not that little. So we've got issues about what to do with border crossings and how we're going to handle those. And nobody's really come up with a really great idea for that yet. Um, on the other hand, I think there are some solutions uh, to that problem, uh, but it would require uh, a lot of cooperation from people who like businesses that might otherwise be somewhat opposed. So tough, tough issue. I mean, I think ideally the best way to do uh, a single payer would be at the national level so we didn't have to worry about these things. But I think that it could still be done in Ohio, uh, but we'd have to solve a few of those uh, difficult issues and we'd have to have cooperation. We'd have to have people wanting to cooperate. But if anything has ever shown how fragile and easily disrupted our employer-based insurance system is, uh, this COVID epidemic has done it. Uh, it has really proved that uh, private health insurance through employment is a defective product that's not reliable in tough times, barely reliable even in good times. So I, I think that we need to continue to push, and I think these problems are solvable. They're not insoluble, but it does add to the complexity when you're trying to do it as a state. Now, my personal belief is, just one last comment, that uh, almost all tough things that we've done, you, you name the tough thing, ending slavery, women's right to vote, uh, all this sort of stuff, 
those tough things that we tried to do, almost always things got passed in the state before they got passed nationally. The most recent one was uh, family and med uh, 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 medical leave for employees. Um, that, uh, that was brought up in the Clinton administration early on, it failed. California said, oh, we're gonna do it anyway. California passed it, the sky did not fall. Businesses didn't go bankrupt or flee the state of California. And not too long afterwards, we had family and medical leave nationally. Uh, so I think that uh, it does, the history says we should try to pass it in a state first uh, in terms of proving that it works. Even the Affordable Care Act, something similar to it was, was passed in uh, Massachusetts first. So I'm, I'm, I'm gabbing, I'll stop. Let me add, Deb, if I could build off of what Dr. Ross said. He, he reminded me of two points that I wanted to make. First, uh, not all employers uh, are opposed to this. Uh, the, the car industry, for example, the auto manufacturers, um, um, uh, General Motors, Ford, uh, so on, have generally liked the concept because uh, they have it in Canada and they would like to see it in the United States. And they have been uh, quiet supporters of it. They haven't put any money towards it, uh, but they would like to see it. Um, so one, we believe that it would attract employers because it then takes the burden off of the employers to provide that health care. Uh, employers argue, uh, some folks will argue, well, it's going to significantly uh, increase taxes uh, on employers. Well, let me tell you for the, that General Motors and that Ford employer, it may actually lower the taxes, what they're paying out in health care annually, uh, but for the Walmarts of the world that are providing very little health care to their employees, it is, uh, of course, going to increase a, a burden on Walmart, uh, but I think uh, the, Wal the Walton family could, could bear that burden. Uh, uh, in that. The, the other thing is um, with regard to how it impacts Ohio, uh, if we had a single payer universal health care system in Ohio, we, we have been experiencing population loss in this state. If we had it in this state, just think of the number of people that would be interested in coming to the state just because we had that system of, of health care in this. There's been people that actually have gone to Canada because they wanted, that, they needed that health care uh, because of medical conditions or other reasons uh, to go to Canada or elsewhere for that health care. But we could attract uh, uh, people uh, to the state. So I just wanted to add those concepts. Hey, um, NJ, do we have hands up? Yes, we do. Uh, next up is Alice Farina. Um, Alice, go ahead. Uh, Michael, I wanted to share with you that I've had several personal meetings with a progressive Democrat who is my representative, Alison Russo, and I'm sure you know her, and I'm sure you're aware that she has a, an advanced degree in public health policy. Um, my meetings with her, obviously, were before the pandemic, and I, I need to find a way to communicate with her again, but... <clears throat> The message that I got from her was, well, you know, um, this is a good idea, but there's no point in working on it with the present composition of the General Assembly. We have to wait until after redistricting, hope we can get a Democratic majority, and then we can do something, which I found a very disappointing thing. So what I have seen Allison do is what I call nibbling at the edges. She introduces little packets of things that expand uh, a little bit of something here and a little bit of something there. Uh, she is, she was, I cannot say she is, she uh, was disinterested and felt it would be a waste of her time and energy uh, to influence influence this particular legislation. Now, I do plan to get in touch with her again. But I'm wondering, do you think that with a pandemic that um, there might be some bipartisan recognition that maybe we need to look at a more fundamental approach? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And I, I think uh, you had mentioned this uh, once before uh, to me. So let me start off by saying, I think uh, uh, Representative Russo is, is an incredible legislature and, and extremely 
well versed on on healthcare issues, and I have it the deepest amount of respect for Representative Russo. I think she's a great addition to the caucus. Um, with regard to the amount of energy for her to add her name as a co-sponsor, is no energy whatsoever. Her aide just needs to call over to my office and say, "Could you add as a co-sponsor?" sponsor. To build up the co-sponsors in the legislation is very important. And she may not hear about the legislation then for the rest of the session herself. Uh, it'd be nice for her to advocate more with her colleagues, but that's great. But it takes nothing for her to add her name if she uh, supports the concept uh, uh, of this. Uh, she, as well as many others, continue with the incrementalism uh, of the health care, which does not get us very far whatsoever. Uh, organization, I think, is doing great work on healthcare, but it seeks the incremental approaches. You can, for example, I know uh, um, uh, uh, Span Ohio and you can work together on a lot of issues, uh, but they have always been focused on the, the uh, incremental uh, efforts to get more and more people covered. And uh, it could take several hundred years uh, to accomplish this uh, in, in, in their uh, process while, while people are dying. Uh, we, what we need to do is, uh, it would be nice, um, you know, Bernie Sanders made a huge impact. The problem is, is Bernie's not going to be running for that national president again. Uh, we really, it would be nice to have that national official uh, take charge of this. But what we need to do is make sure that Every legislator, every person holding public office is aware of this issue, is educated on this issue. So as they advance in the system, if they start off as a state senator like Barack Obama and then become uh, a, a, a U.S. senator and then become president, that when they are running for the state senate, they are educated on this and they make it a priority going up. Because if they do become that national leader, they have that foundation. Uh, so we need to walk, work on everybody, um, and and hopefully um, uh, in in uh, this this uh, group of of folks that are running for offices, whether the progressives or even moderates, that we can get people educated about this and really uh, carry this as a uh, a policy agenda. Uh, now, with regard to getting something passed, I uh, last. Uh, session, I got a, a legislation passed that I carried for eight, uh, excuse me, uh, six uh, sessions of the General Assembly. I finally got it passed last session. So sometimes you need persistence in working on it. And uh, when the time is right, it, it's, gonna, it's going to pass. And with regard to uh, getting it done at the state level first, I think we need to do that. That's how Canada got their national system. That's how we, as Dr. Ross said, we got so many things here. I just had recent experience. If you know that Procter & Gamble and a lot of those companies used to have those uh, uh, microplastics uh, in their, their hand washing soaps and uh, toothpaste, that plastic was getting into the water system and going out into uh, the, the water uh, into Lake Erie. And there were some scientists that said that the fish were eating these microplastics and, and uh, the toxic toxins were building up in there in this because these plastics uh, it, uh, uh, attract the toxins in the environment. Uh, we at the state level start passing legislation to ban those those uh, uh, microplastics in, in those products. Finally, the federal government took that up uh, because they didn't like, uh, they wanted a, a national policy as opposed to a state by state patchwork system. So we need to do at the state level. Uh, we need to talk to all those legislators and, and it's nothing to add your name as a co-sponsor. And, but if we, we are looking for joint sponsors, both in the Senate and the House, if I had uh, another good joint sponsor that can really be advocating out there, I talk about this issue all the time to members of my caucus and Republican members, uh, anytime I have their ear on, ear on healthcare. And they all know that I support a Medicare for all and, and single payer. Thank you. Um, Bill, you wanna read another question from the chat? Yeah, uh, Monica Niederman says that uh, her uh, physical therapist nephew hates the uh, idea of universal health care because he needs the income of private insurance to balance Medicare payments. 
She's wondering if improving payments to doctors and hospital providers in the plan uh, will get more of their support. Uh, yes, so this is a problem. I, I mentioned this in my, my general talk, uh, is both with Medicare. Medicare is a little bit better than Medicaid. Medicaid are the state-run programs. Uh, and um, for the most part, the, the state sets the reimbursement rates for uh, Medicare, all the uh, uh, service deliveries for Medicare. Uh, the unfortunate part, particularly in, in uh, uh, um, uh, Republican-dominated uh, states, the reimbursement rates are, are, tend to be low because they don't support these programs. And uh, the reimbursement rates sometimes don't change for 20, 25 years. We have uh, Medicaid rates for some providers that haven't changed for 15, 20 years. Uh, no no uh, increases whatsoever. How do you keep up with inflation? How do you keep the providers there? That's why some people don't want to go into certain fields uh, because they, they can't get uh, the reimbursement or they don't, just don't, won't take the, the patients. Uh, so this is something that every country that delivers health care, uh, that pays for health care, has to deal with. Uh, we need to take a look at those areas that do it better. You know, so there was uh, efforts in Canada to, to, uh, to balance their budget. And one of the first things was uh, money going into health care. Same thing in England, to balance their budget. Money going into health care was, was under attack. What we need to do is, is make sure that um, the money going to the health care is, is a priority, and maybe it is something that we should put in the Constitution to make sure it's adequately funded. Okay, thank you. John Ross, do you have a question from the uh, um, hands up? Yes, uh, Arlene Sheik's had her hand up a long time. Is your arm numb, Arlene? Thank you so much for all of your many years of work and support for us. Um, and I uh, wondered, within, within the state legislature, are there any individuals for whom you think we should particularly focus? Okay, so uh, we have to, I, I will say this uh, um, uh, gently, I, I think we have to do some healing. Uh, so uh, Representative Bernadine Kent is a joint sponsor of the legislation this year. Um, she uh, had some troubles with the caucus, with the Democratic caucus and the General Assembly as a whole. She's, although she's elected, she has not been participating in the General Assembly. There are some uh, real bad feelings with the Legislative Black Caucus and Representative Bernadine Kent, who's also um, uh, African-American. Um, so there were several members of the Democratic caucus that did not join um, the legislation this session because uh, uh, Representative Kent was a joint sponsor of it. That will not exist. She's not running for re-election. So we'll, one will have to get a, uh, a, another joint sponsor. I'd like to bring on another joint sponsor. It's always nice to have a, a colleague uh, on this. It'd be nice to get a Republican joint sponsor. Um, but so we, we need to shore up. And Deb, I don't know if you can provide those who co-sponsored it the last session compared to this session uh, who are still in the General Assembly and those who, who sponsored it in the prior session but didn't sponsor it this session but are still in the General Assembly. We need to reach out to them again to get them on board as we move forward. Uh, and I, I will do that personally. Um, and again, I... Uh, I think people need to talk to Dr. in the Democratic side, like Dr. Liston, uh, Representative Liston, uh, Allison Russo, uh, Jessica Miranda. Um, um, th there'll be new uh, members of the General Assembly coming in. We need to reach out to all of them. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, the other thing is the Span Ohio actually should try to request uh, a direct meeting with the Legislative Black Caucus uh, to meet and talk to the Legislative Black Caucus as a whole. I would, I would say get two or three people from the SPAN, uh, Dr. Ross, for example, um, uh, 
to talk to the Legislative Black Caucus uh, maybe at the end of this year or at the beginning of next year as we're starting the new General Assembly. Hey, thank you, Mike. And Mike, I wanted to um, let you know something. Um, UK and Ohio with new leadership has been very supportive of what SPAN is doing. And um, we look at it that what they are doing, what their um, emphasis is, is to get as many people um, coverage under what's a, currently available for what they need right now. You know, while we're working for the long-term picture and trying to make sure that everybody is going to be um, covered, but we've had a very, very good and cooperative relationship um, in the last couple of years. And so I want to say thanks to um, Steve Wagner for that. Good. He has brought about a big change. It's good to hear that. And if I could just uh, put a plug in, uh, I see that April Stotes is on the line with us. I will say that April Stotes was one of those SPAN people that came to me was on, when I was on Lakewood City Council and say, where are you? Would you be willing to introduce a resolution on Lakewood City Council? So April is, has been one of those who has been a quiet um, advocate for single payer in Ohio uh, in that, uh, you know, she, she hasn't rose up in leadership or anything like that, but she, she always beats the drum at the local level and, and she, she joined us uh, in this meeting uh, this evening. Great. Um, let's see, are we doing chat or hands? Mm -hmm. I think we're doing chat, Bill. Okay. Um, so Tim Bruce asks, could you talk about global budgets as regards hospitals? Uh, we lost a hospital here in the underserved part of Dayton. Would that happen if HB 292 were the law? So, um, I, I think a, um, two things that need to be examined is um, you need to get the, uh, the universal single payer, the publicly funded single payer plan, universal health care plan out there. Uh, you need to make sure the reimbursement rates are reasonable for all medical providers from uh, the doctors to the hospitals. Uh, you also need a system back to what we were talking about, the certificate of need program that was instituted under Jimmy Carter, uh, where uh, we don't have duplication of services, say, in, in a particular area, but we're trying to get services out to all areas uh, of, of, of the nation, of, of the state and of the nation. Uh, my belief is that if, if we had a, a stable, uh, uh, publicly funded, uh, universal health care system, I think uh, that would enable hospitals uh, to be more successful when, than what they have been. And that's my, and I don't know if Dr. Ross has any more insight or studies on that, but I, I think you see it actually, you would see delivery, medical delivery in, in rural areas better. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Mike. I think that we would see We'd be able to provide incentives for people to work in rural areas, first of all, because you could adjust the reimbursement. And if people are unattracted to rural areas, you could put a little more money in the pot or to center city areas uh, or underserved areas in general. And for hospitals, this, this just amazes me. Hospitals are losing money in the, big, in, in the middle of the biggest pandemic that we've seen because they're, they can't do elective procedures that are overpaid for versus the sort of life-saving care and other uh, care that's uh, medically necessary. I, to me, that hospitals could be losing money in the middle of a pandemic is completely uh, amazing. And, and so no hospital would ever lose money if we globally budgeted them. Uh, there'd be public oversight uh, of their expenditures, but you, you know, if they had honest budgets, uh, they would need to bill no one. So if they provided a publicly reviewed, reasonable budget, they would not have to worry in rural areas or center city areas whether they had the money they needed to take care of the people they were taking care of. Uh, that would stabilize it. And the ups and downs of the, of the uh, employment environment isn't going to affect them. People will still be able to come and get the care they need. It would stabilize uh, hospital funding dramatically if they went to global budgets. Um, what they lose is the ability to overcharge us and keep the money and build Taj Mahals and what have you, right? 
So I, I think that, uh, you know, the hospitals are still a little reluctant and uh, it would be good to drag some hospital administrators uh, to, country, to another country where they do global budgeting and have them take a look at it because for many hospitals, it would, it would be life-saving and it would allow them to continue to serve underserved communities and it would stabilize the budgets for, for others. On the other hand, up here in Northwest West Ohio, we have a big health system, ProMedica, that saved up enough billions of dollars by overcharging us. It's our money. They, they charged us more than they needed to for the care they provided. They kept that money. They bought a national nursing home chain with it. What the, huh? WT, <laughs> yeah. nursing home chain? Hey, stick to the knitting. Take care of the community here, right? Don't worry, uh, the so seven tentacle will take them over someday. Yeah, well, anyway, uh, so to me, this is, you know, there's some amazing stuff. And I think that, that, that there would be stability. Ditto for doctors. You know, I actually asked an orthopedic group to look at their building for me. And I said, if everybody, if we took all the, the payments and we averaged them, so they're doing uh, uninsured people, taking care of them with their broken hips anyway. They were doing Medicaid at underpayment, Medicare at uh, adequate payment, and being overpaid by private. And I said, if you took all that and mashed it together and we paid you the average, would you care? And then they thought about it and said, no, you know, just keep us whole. And it would be so much simpler because you could give people a, a chipped card and they could come in. Doctor puts his uh, pin in the computer, patient puts their pin in the computer, you put the chip card in, hit a button, the money goes directly to the doctor's bank account, just like a credit card transaction. Billing costs go down, uh, they don't have to fuss and bother with what's eligible for a given patient through a given insurance, everybody's eligible for everything we agree should be covered. Uh, the simplicity of it is uh, magnificent and would save a lot of money. Most, if, if we paid, the average amount across those different sectors of payment to, to doctors, and then they had the savings from the simplicity of the billing, they would actually end up better off, not worse off. You know, um, the there's a saying, health follows wealth, and it's followed by medicine follows the money. And we find <laughs> overabundance of services in wealthy areas and a dearth of services in your rural poor areas. Um, Canada you know, has gone through that experience, and when they enacted their single-payer universal health care, what they found was that medical services started moving out to those underserved areas because there was now money to pay for them. So, yes, I think yes, it's in underserved areas. We have two more hands up. I think Bob Parker would be the next one. I don't know if you want to do that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank you, Mike, for hey, your Bob. work. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, Mike, I'd like to thank you as well as other people for your work. And so I have two related questions. When you, people ask you about your bill and single payer, are they mostly asking about the question of single payer in general, or are they kind of like only questioning whether it would work in Ohio? And similarly, do they ask you about the details of your bill or are they mostly asking about single payer in general? Thanks, Bob. Um, so when I get most of the questions, uh, they're not asking about the details of the bill. Uh, so they, they are talking about how do you pay for it? Uh, that's one of the top questions. And um, they talk about uh, how do you get coverage? Uh, uh, what type of coverage do you get? And, uh, uh, you know, what people don't get is that although there's these taxes put in place, it just replaces uh, what they're paying out anyways in, in uh, the, the co-pays, the deductibles, the insurance premiums that they and or their employees are, are providing. Uh, and many times they, are be, they will be paying less to the, the publicly funded system uh, because you reduce the administrative costs and things like that uh, than they would be under the current system. They just don't get that um, that the money that they're already putting out in the health care, uh, that's all going to be taken care of in, in the new system. And they're really not going to, if anything, they're going to probably save more money uh, than uh, 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 lose more money on it. 
uh, they, they don't get that concept. And that's, that's something that I try, uh, keep on trying to explain. And I think that's national. So even in the, the presidential debates, you, you hear that. And I was also asking if you get questions like they just ask about Ohio versus national or like they might say it worked nationally, but not in Ohio. No, they, uh, it's very, well, I, so those that are not interested say it, this should just be done at the national level and, and end the conversation. Uh, and that tends to be, come from uh, more conservative people and say, we, we shouldn't be doing this at the state level. It should, should be done nationally. And I, I've had those questions in committee and I, and the only time I get those questions are in committee. And, uh, I respond, you know, that most of, of the movements in our nation started at the state levels, and in Canada, uh, it started at the province level uh, until they got the, the national. Okay. Thank you. Um, Bill, questions okay. in the chat? Uh, well, it looks like Fritz Neal has his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Fritz? Um, yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Skindel, for all of your work uh, over the years. Um, and um, my, my question was um, sort of already answered, but, but and it was um, uh, how, how is it going to work if uh, somebody works in Ohio but lives in another state or works in another state, but lives in Ohio, un under your bill. So uh, my understanding, so this applies to any Ohio resident. If they're working in another state, they would be covered by this program. So uh, there would have to be a system for reimbursement to that out-of-state provider. Uh, so the, the healthcare agency that is established under the bill would set up a system to ensure, and they would probably model um, uh, normal uh, insurance or Medicare or Medicaid reimbursement uh, in that and probably set up some type of an arbitration procedure if there's a dispute. Uh, so that, uh, that would be applied for that. Uh, here, uh, what would happen is uh, uh, you, you do have uh, some issues, but uh, the medical providers will still need uh, when somebody who is not a resident comes in and uh, needs health care, uh, they would have to be covered by their, their own health care. I would like to see a system put in place that if somebody who is not a resident comes into Ohio uh, and is not covered by any health care coverage, um, that um, uh, th there would have to be some criteria, but uh, that they would be covered. So let me give you an example. A migrant worker who is coming into Ohio temporarily um, um, they, uh, they would get that health care coverage while they're, they're here uh, uh, handling the tomato crop, uh, for example. Okay, and just one quick comment about on the issue of reimbursement. Um, one thing that is, you know, a lot better with um, a, you know, public reimbursement is that you know that the doctor or the hospital or the health care provider is going to get paid 100%. Whereas with private insurance, I know a lot of that, if, if the person doesn't have private insurance at all, they may, might get nothing paid of it. Or if they have, you know, poor health insurance, they, they would only get a portion of the bill paid for it. So I think that has to be taken into account as well. Yeah. Well, it also, you just, the disparities. So uh, somebody who is private pay, the the if you go to a hospital and you say your private pay, uh, the bill is that outlandish compared to what the insurance company would pay or Medicare would pay or Medicaid would pay. Uh, you know, it, it, it's 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 you know twenty thirty times greater uh, if you're a private pay. Uh huh. You know, and that's that's a ridiculous system. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, Bill. Question from the chat. Uh, yeah, Beth Workman uh, says she's a candidate for Ohio House in District 92, and she knows the span doesn't have much money, but does anyone know of any groups that financially support candidates that will vote for single-payer health care? 
Uh, she's just wondering if we can provide her with any information on that. And she also wondered if the Ohio Medical Association uh, is a supporter of SPAN. Okay, I can answer both of those. No, Ohio Medical Association is not a supporter of SPAN uh, or single payer. Uh, uh, let me say this, though. Uh, I have been invited to uh, uh, conferences with medical students like at Case Western Reserve or elsewhere. The, the younger medical students are very enthusiastic uh, about single payer. Uh, I, I get a, a very positive uh, response there. With regard to um, entities that support people, at one time, I, I know that the UAW on their questionnaire, uh, their endorsement questionnaire asked uh, your position on it. Uh, I don't know if they do it anymore, uh, but at one time uh, they did ask, and that was the only entity out there I knew asked about your position because UAW historically, and actually UAW did provide funding to SPAN in the past. Uh, uh, they, they've been the ones that have been out front and supportive of, of a single payer or Medicare for all. Mike, any parting comments? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank uh, Span uh, for having me on and uh, uh, all the work over the years that uh, you guys have done. And, and I'm deeply honored by the, the, uh, the Smitty Award uh, tonight. Thank you. Oh, well, that was unanimous vote by the State Council that you should be awarded that. Right. And, um, and, really stuff. and I want to invite people that um, if you haven't been participating in the road to um, justice and freedom, um, there's been an every Sunday afternoon event where we are socially distanced, wearing masks, and standing on street corners promoting House Bill 292. And next Sunday is going to be our culminating activity. And if you're in the Cleveland area, you might want to come out to the Metro Health location. Um, Mike is going to be a speaker along with Ivanka Hall, I believe, and Kristen Kranz from Our Revolution, and Ted Seuss from SPAN and stuff and it's from one to three uh, but there will also be um uh group demonstrations in cincinnati and, and dayton i'm uh, i understand and you can go to the um our revolution page it's been sent out in the um, emails and you can find a location and you can also check on the span facebook page and you can find a link there to find out where the locations are. But we hope if you're in the Cleveland area that you'll come out and hear Mike again. And if you haven't participated in one of these, please participate next week. It's a culminating activity and a collaboration between SPAN Ohio and our revolution. And we thank you for joining us and we'll be sure to come back next month on July 19th when we have Ivanka Hall. And if we, and I've saved the chat, if there's any questions we miss, we will get an answer for you and get it out to you. So, and then you can invite your friends to watch the uh, broadcast of this on our YouTube channel, which you can access through the SPAN webpage again. Thank you. Thank you to Mike. And Bye. Bye. I'm muted everybody so that we can all give Mike a, a, a clap goodbye. Hey, thanks. Bye, Mike. Congrats, Mike. Mike.